So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the CSTA Western Mass monthly meeting and we have some amazing presenters today. We are so fortunate to have the founder, uh, Tom Blowers from BirdBrain presenting on meaningful AI for the classroom. And we also have Sarah Fitzhenry who uh, is the learning and community manager. And she is also our robotic fairy godmother who will be monitoring the chat. So welcome everyone. I'm so excited. I can't wait for this. So I'm sure you guys are as excited as I am. Um, take it away, Tom. All right. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for inviting us to be here. Um, so just to give you a very quick overview of BirdBrain Technologies, we're a small educational robotics company in Pittsburgh. We're all about deep and joyful hands-on learning experiences for all students. And we do that through creative robotics and also through coming up with some lessons that don't use robots. So what we're going to be talking about today uh, is based on an Hour of Code activity that we submitted uh, last fall that's on the Hour of Code website and on our website, where you can get hands-on with training an AI model or your students can get hands-on with it, and then using that model to control or to use it in a blocks-based programming environment. Um, so I will start with my presentation. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Everybody got that? Good. OK. So. Um, you know, before I get started, as we mentioned, Sarah is going to be monitoring the chat. And so I sometimes have a tendency to just run away with things. Uh, so she may stop me if there are some, some questions that I'll need to address. I'll also try to stop every five minutes or so just, just to answer any questions that do come up. So do put your questions in the chat as you have them. And I may leave some time at the end for questions also. It depends on how quickly I go, I guess. Um, all right, so I thought I, I've given this presentation a few times, and for this one, I really thought about, you know, what do I want you to take away from this presentation? And it is that, you know, students shouldn't just use AI. It's that they should also be involved in the process of training and customizing simple AI models, because by doing that, you explore the blind spots, limitations, and the power of the technology. And the thing is, there are tools out there that allow a middle schooler or a high school student to do this. And so it's not something that needs to be just the province of, of AI experts or people with PhDs in computer science. It is something that all of your students can experience in just a couple of hours. And so that's really what this webinar is about. It's about trying to, to break things down to make it something that is practical that you can do in your classroom as a essentially as a hands-on or project-based activity. Um, so I'm going to hopefully in the next hour show you how to do that. So first of all, the link to the slides is right here. If you're going to follow along, or actually even if you're not going to follow along, uh, copy that link. Uh, Sarah will put it in the Zoom chat, and it has a lot of embedded links in it that you can then use later on. Um, so before I start, I'm going to get on a soapbox for five or 10 minutes and talk about AI and machine learning and what we're actually doing today. Uh, and then I also want to give you an overview of our AI lessons as they are right now, because you can use the things that we're showing, not just to control blocks-based programs, but also to control robots. So you can make uh, models, AI models that control our robots. And then we're going to do a live demo. So I'm going to walk through training a model with a tool called Google Teachable Machine. I'm going to show you how to import that model into Snap, which is a blocks-based programming environment. And if you want to follow along, um, I would suggest grabbing three items while I'm on my soapbox talking about AI and machine learning. Just grab three items that are maybe different colors or different shapes. Um, so for example, I'm holding up three leaves because the I did this once in the fall and I went and grabbed three items and I just picked them up on my bike ride here to the studio. Um, I'm going to be using our printables. So we have a printable where you print out kind of pictures of different birds. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be using those, but you can use any three items if you want to follow along. 
Now that said, there's a lot of people on the call and there isn't that much time. So if, if this was more of a workshop or we had a couple hours, um, I would be making sure that all of you did this and that, you know, uh, we could walk through any tech support or issues that, that any, any individual person had. I'm going to try to keep this streamlined for this call, but if you do run into problems, if, I, if there's time for questions at the end, I can help or we can help, um, or you can email us afterwards and also, you know, get any sort of help that way. Um, you can always say something in the chat because I'm here. Yeah. And yeah, Sarah may be able to help you kind of right at the moment at the moment also. And so then after the live demo, I'll do another quick demo to just show you how this same kind of process can work to then control a robot with with the same model that you've already trained. All right. So, you know, the goal for today is to train a model where you show an object to the camera and you have a block space program that then does something. Now, in this case, it's controlling a robot, um, but it doesn't have to. It could be showing an animation on the screen. You know, it can be anything that a scratch or snap game, any block based game uh, can do. Um, so that is our goal. But before I go there, let's talk about AI. So I actually have some beef with the, the term AI, um, and that's probably why I'm doing this. The problem I have with it is that it is a very imprecise term. And when we are talking, when we are communicating, precision sometimes is important, right? So let me give you an example. Your parents' uh, community might want some AI lessons in the classroom. That could be a very broad thing. Um, your principal might be pushing for more AI. Well, what does it mean? Um, what, what exactly do they want, right? And so by giving you these the definition, you can then go to them and say, is this what you want? Is, is, is the kind of activity we're doing today what you want? Well, what we're doing today is we're training a machine learning model. Um, so when it comes to artificial intelligence, again, our broadest definition is any system that allows a machine to make a decision. And I, when I look up terms, I like broad definitions because then you can always poke holes in them. Um, so any system that allows a machine to make a decision. So like your home thermostat, when it turns on the furnace, is that AI? I don't know. So the problem is that with it, when it comes to AI, nobody really agrees on how much intelligence you need for something to count as AI. And you see this in culture. You see basically, like I've, I've read about this as the AI effect where they were referencing checkers, chess, and go. Like in the 1960s, we had computer programs that could play pretty good checkers. And then in the 80s and 90s, we made computer programs that could play really good chess. And now we have systems that can play, that can beat any, any player at any of those games and can also beat us at go which is a much um, more complex game than chess or checkers. And every time that happened, that was at the forefront of AI, right? Checkers in the 1960s was the forefront of artificial intelligence and chess in the 1990s was the forefront of artificial intelligence. So we keep redefining what we mean. Um, and you know, my, my favorite is like a couple of uh, pithy quotes like AI is whatever hasn't been done yet, or intelligence is whatever machines haven't done yet. And so there is this kind of moving of the goalposts uh, that happens with the term AI. We've got a good so, question in the chat. You've defined AI, but can you define robot for us? <laughs> I can. I actually, I think I do later on, but um, the my, game. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, I'll, we'll we'll get there, I think later on. But in general, when it comes to a robot, my definition is something that people make that is a technological artifact that senses its environment, has a processor, and then can basically take that sensory information and then moves or acts within that environment in some way. Again, that's also a broad definition. Um, but that's kind of the paradigm that I that I look for when I think, oh, what is a robot? Um, so when it comes to machine learning, machine learning is a specific way, I, I, instead of type, it's really a way of generating artificially intelligent systems. And it is the way that is, that is responsible for most of the major breakthroughs in AI research in the last decade. And the way machine learning works is it takes large amounts of data 
and then makes models that then make predictions. So it's it's taking all of it's absorbing like tons terabytes of data, and it's looking for patterns. And then out of those patterns, it can then predict sort of what you know. If you give it some similar input to the things that it was trained on, it can predict some some sort of output, right? So if you train it on a lot of um, X rays and you say these have cancer and these don't. Then uh, you show it a new X-ray. It should be able to predict with some accuracy whether it has whether there's cancer in that X-ray or not. Um, and the reason I would say that this technique works now and didn't work, say, 30 years ago, is just because we have so much more data. We have a whole internet of data, and we have ways for software to traverse that internet of data and just absorb it all or absorb a large part of it. Um, so, you know, common modern applications of machine learning include, you know, face recognition, like when you unlock your phone, my phone, it, it unlocks based on my face. Um, recommendation engines, which you interact with probably every day. I mean, if you use Netflix or Amazon or TikTok or any social media, it's showing you things based on what you've seen before. It's training based on your previous preferences. Uh, language translation, so, you know, just translating, you know, you can do Google Translate on a web page and just change it into another language, and it's getting better every every year, I notice. It's it's actually re relatively good now. Um, and then most recently, and the thing that is probably the reason that we have a lot of people signed up to this webinar and uh, has created a lot of discussion are, are these image and text generators, right? So image generators like Dolly or Midjourney, uh, text generators, and they can also do code uh, like ChatGPT. These are based on um, machine learning. So, you know, where are we at this moment in time? Humans still need to train models. They still need to provide good prompts. And I've been, I've interacted with ChatGPT a fair amount. And one of the things I've noticed is that when I wanted to do like a task, um, you know, when it's not just a conversation, but it's like, I want you to do this. I have found that if I structure my prompts almost like a computer program or like an algorithm, I get better output. So, you know, if I say, let's take this step by step, step one, please do this, step two, please do that, I get better output from it than if I just kind of give it a, you know, a one sentence like, hey, please do this for me. Um, so providing good prompts is is something that people need to do in order to make these systems work well. And ironically, or maybe not ironically, you're using computational thinking skills when you do that. Um, editing and approving the output certainly is still very important um, because these models uh, are not like the computers that we've all grown up with. They make mistakes. And that is just something that is so weird, I think. For us, you know, I've always learned that a computer has essentially perfect output, right? If you ask it what is 100 times 10,000, it will tell you the number exactly, and it will never make a mistake. It's impossible for it to make a mistake, essentially, when it's calculating something like that. And now we have these things that are computers that make mistakes in basic facts. It's very strange. Um, so we definitely need to be people to still be experts in content so that they can tell when the computer system is wrong. Um, and you need to manage. I mean, I, I feel like right now where we are with AI is, or with machine learning models is you're managing like a team of, of smart interns. You know, they don't, they don't seem to, they seem to be naive in some ways, um, but they're very good if you give them good direction. So, you know, doing all of the above well requires an understanding of how machine machine learning models work <coughs> and computational thinking skills. And I would say on the first part on machine learning, you know, that is something that you get some insight into by actually training a model. Um, so just tying it back to why are we doing this today? It's because knowing how this works or at least having some intuition into how it works will help you be better at using it. Um, Whenever I see a uh, like an education hype cycle, um, and that we are definitely in one with AI, I go back to this quote, which I first discovered like 
when I was working on my PhD and I put it in my PhD because, you know, as, as a technologist, um, you're always kind of thinking about your technology is going to change everything. And so there's this, this kind of an optimism bias in terms of how much it will change. And so I saw this and I thought, wow, Thomas Edison said that over a hundred years ago, that's crazy. Um, schools don't change that quickly. So I just want us all to kind of reset some of what we're, you know, some of the more outlandish things like there'll be no teaching in, or there'll be no teachers in five years, or there'll be no, like, no one will need to learn to code it within the next few years, or no one will ever write an essay again. Those kinds of things are unlikely to happen. There are definitely going to be changes as a result of these technologies, but they will happen at a slower pace than is probably currently predicted by the most if at least if they're if they're people working directly in AI, it'll probably not go as fast as those people are predicting. All right, so that's my soapbox. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, just to give you a brief tour of our full AI resources, um, they're all linked here. So we have four activities where you can use Finch with Snap. Um, so the first one uses image recognition, which is what we're doing today. The second is audio. So that's like talk to your computer and make the robot go and do something. The third is pose, which means it's just like you can, if you ever use like the uh, Connect, the Xbox Connect, it's basically skeletal tracking. And then the fourth is actually a deeper dive into the math of artificial intelligence and machine learning, where it will um, kind of recognize you, you know, you draw something like in the canvas in Snap, and it'll recognize that and predict kind of what you're trying to draw. So that's Finch. We also have similar lessons for Python. So the same kind of set of lessons almost. Uh, and then for Hummingbird, we don't have a Python set of lessons, but we do have um, three Snap activities that are very similar to the three Finch Snap activities. Um, and so some example prompts, you know, we are, our first lesson is very step by step, but once the kids get it, they could do some other things like uh, an example is making a speech or gesture controlled finch. So drive your robot around by talking to it, or by gesturing at it, uh, making a candy sorter or any sort of sorter with a hummingbird, right? Like imagine like a conveyor belt, and you're looking at different candies and you're then sorting them into different buckets. So it has almost like an advanced manufacturing or CTE um, kind of possibility or output. Um, so really, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities with this uh, technology once you've got once you've got the basics down. Um, so what we're going to work on, what I'm going to show you a demo of right now is our hour of code lesson which is no robot required and block-based and uses our image recognition activity. So um, just so you know what that looks like, you know, it has a teacher guide, a slide deck that you can use with your students, uh, and then some links to uh, a printable and the SNAP project that we're going to use and Google Teachable Machine, and just an overview of kind of what it is. Let me just stop because I realized I I need to find the chat. Just make sure there's nothing in it that I got you on the chat. We are all wrapped. All right, good. We couldn't think of any questions. We're too focused. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, so let's get hands on. So again, I'm going to go through this as a demo. But if you have three objects in front of you, you may be able to keep up. I'll, I'll try not to go too fast. Um, so. What we're going to be doing is first, we're going to use Google Teachable Machine. And that's to, to basically train a machine learning model to recognize the different objects that we're showing our computer. So we're, I'm going to show it, uh, like I said, I'm going to show it um, three different objects, a hummingbird, a picture of a finch, and a picture of an owlet. Uh, I'm going to label. You know, so I'm going to show it a finch and I'm going to label this is a finch. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the hummingbird picture and the owl picture. Then I'm basically going to hit a, a button that says train and it is going to do some black box math, which 
this this part is not really explained by doing this sort of hands-on project, uh, short project. Um, there's just essentially something going on where it's training. Getting into the math deeply is something, well, hopefully like this kind of project excites your students and then you can have further discussions, point them at resources that maybe explain a little bit more uh, what's actually going on under the hood. And then we're gonna test. We're gonna check if it is able to predict uh, the right thing. Um, so I'm gonna hold up a finch and see what it thinks. And then maybe I'll I'll hold up like this go picture and see if it thinks it's a finch, a hummingbird or an owl. No. Um, and then we're going to use Snap to um, import that model and make a program to use it. All right, so for the rest of this, I'm going to go through our hour of code slides, which are part of that lesson uh, that I linked uh, a couple slides back. Um, so these are great for you to use directly with your students. We're gonna start on slide 10, but I'll just zoom through them a little bit. So you can see there's this kind of stop and think and discussion points. Um, oops. Why is this slide? Okay, it's a video, that's why. Um, so just a little bit of kind of background briefing for, for your kids, some real world examples. And then, you know, what I just said about this is what we're doing. We're going to use Owlet and Finch and Hummingbird to recognize, diff we're going to make a model that recognizes different birds. Um, you know, a little bit about how it works. I showed you that video already. So here's where we start. So first, you know, there's a worksheet, of course. Um, and you're going to cut out, you know, the three things that I already have cut out, the Hummingbird, the Owlet, and the Finch. And then we open Google Teachable Machine. Now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen on this computer and move over to another computer because when I do this and am running a Zoom call, uh, because I'm using the video, it's actually easier for me to, um, to basically uh, use a second computer instead. So let me share my screen here. All right, so now you can see me in, um, so this is this is basically Google Teachable Machine. Uh, this is their interface. Um, and we'll just run through like the different steps um, in, you know, the hour of code slides. So like step three, it's telling me, I we want to do three different classes. Um, one that's named Hummingbird, one that's named Owlet, and one that's named Finch. And I'm going to switch that just a little. I'm going to have a fourth class called Nothing. So I'm going to just rename my classes Hummingbird, Owlet. Now I'm going to add a class called Finch. And then I'm going to add a fourth class called Nothing. Um, so I'm going to open my webcam. Oop, I didn't mean to crop it. Open my webcam. And I'm going to show it my hummingbird. This is the hummingbird. And I'm going to make about 300 pictures of this hummingbird, but I'm going to do it really fast. So there's a hold to record button that basically takes something like 10 pictures per second. And so as I show it the hummingbird, I'm gonna like do that basically from all different angles. I'm gonna kind of try to do this, 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 this. Upside down. So now I've got, yeah, 345 samples of something that looks like a hummingbird to, to this model or some something that has been classified as a hummingbird for this model. Um, and if I don't like any of these, if like one of them turns out, maybe I accidentally showed it the wrong thing, you can delete any of these pictures. So you could, I could delete that, for example. Okay, so there's Hummingbird. And now I'm going to do the same thing with Owlet. 
I'm going to hold to record. Uh, notice that I'm trying to show it kind of big, small, upside down. And finally, I'll do the same thing with Finch. And finally, my nothing class is because I, I don't want it to be classifying like my hand, which is in a lot of these pictures, or my shoulder, as, um, as any one of the three. So I'm just going to record a nothing class, which might have my face, might not, you know, might have nothing at all. Um, so that's what we're doing. All right. And so now I have four classes with about three to 400 pictures in each class. And so now I can hit that train button. And this generally takes a minute or two. Uh, it may take a little longer depending on the, um, you know, depending on the laptop on the, of, of the student. So maybe five or 10 minutes if this was kind of a, a student grade Chromebook. And often it will pop up a message that is like, hey, this web page is still waiting for input or something like that. Um, and if that happens, it almost always happens, you just say, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, just keep waiting. So let's see, there it is. Okay. It actually popped up for just a second at that time. So now it's training some more. So first it has to prepare the training data, then it actually does the training. It's definitely doing the computation on the laptop because there's definitely differences in speed in terms of which computer you're using. So if you have a higher end computer, the training definitely goes faster. So we're almost done here. This is the part they edit out in the cooking show. No, okay, there we go. Um, okay, so now we have a preview and that preview is showing the output. The, so it's showing me what, it, what I am showing to the model, right? My, my face, my hand. It's pretty sure, you know, if you look at these four bars, it's basically telling me the percentage uh, certainty it has that what it is saying, what it is seeing is nothing. So it's saying it's 100% sure that it's seeing nothing. And every now and then I can get like Finch to or Owlet to pop up, I guess. So I didn't train it perfectly. Um, so every now and then it might register like 3% Finch, 97% nothing. But if I then show it, you know, an Owlet, it's very sure it's seeing an Owlet, right? So it's, it's, it's certainly good enough. Now, if I show it like a half an outlet, now it's not so sure. Or if I like zoom out and it's just a tiny little thing, it's not so sure there. But when I get right up to it and give it a good, you know, good view of an outlet, it's it's like that's an outlet. And let's see if it does the same for Finch. Yep. Finch. Pretty sure that's a Finch. And Hummingbird. Let's see. All right. So we have tested this model. We are now sure that it is um, good enough, basically, for what we're going to be doing with it. We've got an interesting question in the chat. Josh okay. wants to know what happens if you put two birds in the frame at the same time. And now I also want to know that. Yeah, I want to know, too. <laughs> See if one, one wins or not. All right. So seems that Finch is beating out Hummingbird here. But I think... Let's try my Alan Finch. Yeah, here it's a little, little closer. 
So do we that's know what a might be causing that. Sorry. Do we know what might be causing that? I no. I mean, I, I I'm not surprised that it can't. It's not intelligent enough to basically say there's two of these and we're going to do 50 percent, 50 percent. You know, it is really expecting just one or the other. Now, as to why it sometimes is, is certain that it's seeing finch when it's a finch and a hummingbird, mm -hmm. that I can't give a better answer to. That is sort of the, um, yeah, I'm not sure why one is winning, I guess, over the other. Cool. Good question, Josh. Yeah, it is a good question. I haven't really tried that, but that's that's the kind of thing that you want students to be doing, right? Is is questioning like, oh, well, what if I move it over here? What if I change my background? Oh, okay. It thinks that's a hummingbird now. That's changed. That's strange, right? Like, so, and then making the connection from this model to something like ChatGPT, where you're like, well, you know, this ChatGPT is just a big scaled up version of this with way more attempts to get it to be accurate but it can it can still make mistakes you know it's very easy to pull this model that you made in five minutes but you know even the really big ones you can still fool or have make mistakes or things like that um all right so once we have our model to the point where we are you know happy with it and again this is there's no way this is ever going to be perfect but um once it works well enough, you can export it. So exporting the model means clicking on the export button. Uh, and then you will want to make a shareable link to your model. So I'm going to upload my model. And when I do, it will make me a shareable link over here. So it's, it's uploading right now. Takes a minute. Now it's there. So I can hit copy. And now I have um, the link to my model, which I will just share with everybody in the chat um, in case you want to play with it later. It's not going to work very well, obviously. Even changing the background inside the studio caused it to fail. Uh, but just so you have something that, you know, that may be, may be fun to play with. Um, so I've got the model. Now the next step is to open a SNAP project that uses that model. So this is, we've now moved through on the Hour of Code slides. Um, we are now on step nine. No, step step one. Yeah, we, we walked through all of, um, uh, all of the uh, Google Teachable Machine part, and now we're entering the SNAP part. So it, you know, so those slides are telling me to open a bit.ly. So I'm going to do that. And it is bit.ly dot slash snap code AI. Okay. So this is a snap project. So if you've ever done any scratch or other blocks programming, this should look fairly familiar to you, right? So it can do quite a few few different things. So um, the first thing I have to do, and this is just a peculiarity to using kind of more advanced extensions in Snap, is I have to go into the gears and I have to basically enable JavaScript extensions. So I go into the settings menu and I do that and make sure that's enabled. Um, I'm going to make this a little bigger also while I'm here so that you can see my blocks more easily. There we go. Um, so the second step is to set the URL of the model. So there's a helpful comment here that's like, first edit the URL with your model's URL, then click on this stack. So I'm going to type, well, I'm going to copy and paste. And uh, there is my model link that I got just a minute ago out of Teachable Machine. And once I've done that, I can click on that. And now it has set the URL and it is loading the model. And it gave me a little, little pop-up that said model loaded successfully. So that's good. Uh, that model loaded successfully part sometimes is a little, it's definitely reliant on internet speed. So 
uh, sometimes it takes a little longer. So once I have that model, um, you know, so now I'm basically on step five of the snap part. I can hit the space bar, which should turn on my camera in snap. Um, and it should start predicting what, um, what it's seeing. So you can see my camera's on. And in my case, it's doing this is this is good because you're you're getting something that's a little unusual. In my case, the camera is only um, occupying part of the canvas. Um, if that happens to you, you can change the stage size from 480 by 360 to um, 320 by 240. So I'm, I'm doing that, but you probably won't have to do that. That seems to mostly happen to me, <laughs> not anybody else. Um, so what's happening here is once I hit space, it is running this block called predict. And predict is basically doing the same thing that the, that the table in Teachable Machine was doing. So the output where it's kind of giving you a percentage likelihood of something. Um, so over here, this is basically the same thing as the predict block in Snap. So it's doing that in a loop. Um, and it's putting that information into a variable, into a list, actually, called prediction. So prediction is a list of four, four um, probabilities. Uh, and those four probabilities, it's four because I have four classes. So you know those four probabilities correspond to my hummingbird class, my owlet class, my finch class, and my nothing class. And if I click on them, you can see that they're kind of updating in real time, but the first three are mostly zero and the last one is almost one. And, and that's because right now I'm not showing it anything. So if I then show it like a finch, now it's saying, okay, well, the third class is the finch class and I'm almost sure that I'm seeing that. And I don't know if people can hear it, but it is also making a sound. Uh, it's making a sound of a, of a finch robot, uh, of a, not a finch robot, of a finch bird. Um, so that's what's going on here. So basically what we've done is we've given you a starter project. And, you know, that starter project includes that predict block. It includes this prediction list of, of variables. Um, and then it includes this last part, which is basically how you use that, how you use those predictions to actually do a anything really, right? So the predictions, again, are from zero to one. And so a one is 100% sure that it's seeing that class. And a zero is it's not sure at all. And so if you look at the code in the in the repeat until loop, you know, the first one is basically saying if the first item of my prediction, which is if basically if to, to kind of try to read this in English, it's like if the probability that my model is seeing a hummingbird is greater than 0.9, then switch the costume to the hummingbird, play a hummingbird sound wait five seconds, um, and then actually, I think it should be switch the costume to the turtle or something like that. So actually, I'll, I'll uh, fix that. Um, and then it does the same thing for item two and the same thing for item three. So just to kind of play with that again, just to show it to you, I'm going to show it a hummingbird. playing a hummingbird sound. I'm going to show it an owl. Playing an owl sound. And then, yeah, I'll show it a finch again. And I think I should probably move the sprite over because it's not in a great place. 
while we're looking at the changing. prediction table, we've got another question in the chat. Josh wants to know, so the probabilities are independent, i.e. the sum isn't one? No, the sum should be one. Yeah. So it, it is it is uh, kind of a mute. That's why it isn't able to do the thing where you um, have two of this, like if you have a hummingbird and a finch, right? You like the smart thing would be it's nearly one for hummingbird and nearly one for finch. But what it really, the way this is really working is um, all of the predictions add up to one. So the highest, so when it is one, all the other ones should be very, very close to zero. For some weird reasons, they're not always exactly zero, but they're like, you know, 10 to the minus eighth or something. They're really, really small. So that must be what Josh saw. I said it, it didn't add up to one for some of the snapshots earlier. Yeah. It was like 106 or. Um... Yeah, it's, I mean, let, let's look at these. I mean, it's like 0.995, and then this one's 0.0037. It, they really should add, add up to one. No, they uh, are maybe now, there's some rounding. They definitely weren't before. OK. Interesting. Um, but yeah, so now now that you have this program working, now you can change it, right? You can do what you whatever you want. Once you know, you can have your model basically do one thing for or a new thing for. Um, sorry, I should probably shouldn't have shown it that. But um, yeah, you can have it do anything that you would use a sort of sensing thing for in a snap program, right? So. Uh, imagine a game of Pong where you're moving the paddle around or um, or you're creating something where um, when you show it um, a picture of some famous historical figure, it it plays a speech by that historical figure. Like you can you can link all of these things up. Um, oh, uh, six point something. OK, I have a I have a another explanation for that which is that sometimes it shows if the if the probabilities are very small it will show it in scientific no notation so it'll say something like 6.534 e to the minus 8 and so it is still adding up to 1 but it's a little harder to tell because scientific notation is a little harder to just see all at once let's see if i can get it down that low No, I guess not, but all right. So um, so that's that's basically the hour of code version of this activity. Um, again, our slides have a lot of stop and thinks. You know, I ran through this in about um, 30 minutes, but in a classroom, I would say, you know, I would give this at least two class sessions, maybe three. In the first class session, you could have them train the model in Google Teachable Machine. In the second class session, you can have them import it into Snap and then have them change their Snap program and have them do something fun, you know, some fun activity, maybe program it, change the program in some way. Um, and then the third one, they could kind of, once they know what they're doing, um, they could make a new model that's you know, basically iterate on the process and make something that's maybe more exciting to them so that it isn't just the um, the exact program that we gave them. Uh, and we can't see the right of the table. I don't know. All right. Um, so let me then just quickly show you how to, how you would do this with a, um, with controlling a robot. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'll just stick to these slides. Um, so to use a robot with your model, like I said before, I've already previewed this thanks to a question. Um, you know, when I talk about robots, I say a robot is something that can sense, think, and act, right? So it might have a light sensor, it might have a core controller that processes that sensory information, and then it can uh, act in the world by lighting up an LED or moving a motor or, you know, any sort, any, many, many other possibilities. 
Um, so with our Finch robot, we have lots of sensors like distance sensors, line sensors, light sensors. We can output by driving around. We can output by putting an emoji on an LED screen. We can output by beeping. Um, so we have kind of sensors and outputs. Um, so the key idea of, of using one of these machine learning models in with a robot is that the machine learning model becomes a new sensor for your robot. So it's now sensing whether I'm showing it a finch or a hummingbird picture or whether I say go or stop, it's sensing a bunch of different, a bunch of new things. And that's very exciting. Um, so I'm going to go to um, a version of Snap that uses our robot that can connect to our robot, to our Finch robot. There we are. Pair. And then I'm going to um, download, again, I need to download kind of an AI project that um, like has the kind of blocks built in to connect to Teachable Machine. So I downloaded that project. I'm going to import it from my downloads. All right, and now this is very similar, right? This is similar to the last uh, project, to the Hour of Code project. So I'm going to want to uh, put in the same model URL again. I'm going to do JavaScript extensions again. Before I can. So I'll hit set URL. Hopefully the model, model loads successfully. Now I can do space again. And now I'm, again, predicting hummingbird, owlets, finches, or nothing. And right now, my code for running the robot is very simple. Basically, if I show it, if, it, if it's pretty sure that you know, it's seeing a hummingbird, if it's more than 90% sure, because this is greater than 0 0.9, uh, then we can move the finch forward by 10 centimeters. So let's do that. Let's move this. Show it a hummingbird, and my finch moved. So if you see, if you look at my other screen, I'm going to go into uh, top finch view mode here. Um, so I'm going to show it a finch, uh, or I'm showing it a hummingbird, and it's causing the the finch to move. So same exact idea, really. And you know, if I want to extend this, I can duplicate this if statement. Um, Maybe I want to do something different when it sees um, an outlet. So I'll move, uh, maybe I'll move backwards. Oops. And I'll also turn on the tail lights white because my outlet is white in color. So I'll do 100, 100, 100. Whereas with my hummingbird, that's blue. The color of the hummingbird is kind of blue, blue, green. So I'm going to do a teal color for hummingbird. So now I show it a hummingbird. It lights up blue. I show it an outlet. It goes backwards and lights up white. And so you can imagine, like now you have something where you can show, you know, you can show go this go uh, thing that I made for another uh, lesson, or you can show stop, and now you can control your robot. You know, in this case, it thinks stop is a hummingbird because it wasn't trained on this, right, at all. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick, quick kind of overview of how you would use these models, both without a robot and with a robot. Let me just check the chat. Okay, yeah, oh, that makes sense that you wouldn't see the E. Um, okay, so let me switch back. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. I'm going to move back to... Uh... We also did get a question about whether we will be sharing the slides. And I believe mm -hmm. the answer is yes, that we can share the slides with everyone. Yep. And it's kind of like a um, a, a Russian doll set of slide decks, uh, right? Because um, we are linking to another slide deck from within this slide deck. So the, um, the slide deck, the, the main slide deck is just bit.ly slash meaningful AI. Uh, 
Um, okay, so let me share my screen over here. Go back to the slide deck over here. All right, so we used our robot, got through Sense Think Act. So yeah, I mean that's that's the demo. Um, if I I know I did go a little bit fast, but um, if you use these steps, you can almost certainly do this in you know thirty to forty minutes on your own, and then as I said, in a classroom setting, maybe in two or three class periods. Um, so you know, just to wrap up a little bit, when you think about introducing this kind of thing, um, you know, your students will come up with a lot of questions. Um, questions that you might want to pose to them include things like, you know, how can you fool the model that you just made? Like, does the distance to the object matter? Does the orientation matter? What if you showed a different background? What if you showed a different camera? So these are, are good things to do um, at, in the first class period, right, where you're focused on the Google Teachable Machine thing. And then again, I emphasize drawing that connection between this model that you trained is not that different from the giant AI models that you might be using, things like ChatGPT. Um, they, a lot more people have worked on those. They've gone through a lot more training. So they are certainly more accurate and less fragile, but the same problems kind of occur in both. Um, and then, you know, you might want to ask them how how they think this works. There is a bit of magic in some of these newer AI models where it is kind of hard to explain. Even, even the people making them can't fully explain why they provide the outputs that they do. And even when it comes to the inputs, um, they start talking in metaphors about like human brains and neurons and things like that, and kind of uh, probabilistic uh, relationships between different pseudo neurons or um so it gets it's it's hard to um it's hard to teach it in terms of talking about what's under the hood i i will say that i have a hard time um explaining it as well um but you might still want to kind of turn that question around on them and see how they think it works um and then yeah i mean once they've gone through the basic activity which we've tried to make very streamlined. And so, you know, we give you sample code, we give you like something that basically works, um, ask them to iterate, what will they do next? You know, what will they do now that they understand how it works? Maybe they can come up with something uh, more fun, more creative. Um, all right, so yeah, that's it. And we got five minutes to spare. So if anybody has questions for Sarah or I, I I'm, just gonna leave this here. Uh, one thing I'll say with the uh, the finch or the hummingbird, if you wanna borrow one, we have a demo program. So if you want to try this sort of AI lesson with a robot, uh, you can borrow one from 60, for 60 days from us. And then I also wanna talk briefly and say for our finch robots, you can borrow 10 or 15. Um, we have applications in June for the following school year. And that one is, uh, it's a philanthropic program. So we're evaluating applications based on who you are serving. But if you're working at a public school, uh, Title I school, anything like that, um, uh, you're very likely to be accepted. All right. Any, any questions for us? I'll share a quick anecdote as our as our questions roll in. I tested this image recognition lesson with some of my eighth graders at the end of the previous school year and being relatively new to AI, I was nervous about bringing it to students um, and they were new to creating with AI. So I really wasn't sure how it, wanna go, how it was going to go. And um, I do have a particularly generous group of students, but we, we had so much fun working through it together um, nobody seemed to mind that we were learning at the same time. And by the end of the hour, the things that they were having their finches do were incredible and not challenges that I ever would have thought of. Um, one actually programmed his finch to play the riff from Weezer's song, Buddy Holly. So when it saw um, an, an image that he had drawn, it went, do, 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 which like... I was totally blown away. So those were eighth graders. So definitely try it with your students. 
Yeah, so we did get a question about grade level. And I, I think middle school and early high school, I would say, I mean, you could you could do this with juniors and seniors too, but I think the sweet spot is probably seventh to 10th grade. And I would say the other thing that is helpful would be for the students to have some blocks programming experience already. You want them to understand uh, what an if statement is, what a loop is, what a variable and a list are. So maybe it's a second semester kind of thing in a class where you're already, you know, or maybe you've done like six weeks, eight weeks of coding, and this is sort of a project that would be exciting for them at the end of that at, in, in a middle school context. Um, in a high school context, you may be able to bring it out anywhere. Um, Hans asked me about Python instead of Snap, and the answer is yes. For uh, If you wanted to do Python with the Finch robot, you could do that um, using kind of our using kind of the same process. Now that is our specific version of Python that's on our website, that's like one of our web apps. Um, so if you just wanted to do regular Python um, and uh, without a robot, I'm not sure what the right solution would be there, but I suspect if you email me, um, there probably is one that I could look up. Um, any other questions? If not, I will stop sharing here. Did you see uh, Michelle's question about resources? I may have missed that one. Let's see. She um, said, any resources that can help explain under the hood actions that I can review? I uh, Let's see. I did have a diving deeper slide that I skipped, but I'll unskip it. It's after <laughs> the question slide, but basically it's a, a link to the teachable machine FAQs um, and some more, uh, and like a blog post at the end about different machine learning models. Um, and then our lessons, like our AI lessons also have a bit more explanation. So if you go, there's a, if you go to like, the snap AI lessons that are linked earlier in this in the um, presentation. Um, there's a basics of machine learning. And then there's also some suggested reading on that page. Um, and then let's see, any, ch any plans for Python and the bit? Uh, that works right now. Oh, Python and the bit and AI. Um, that uh, we don't have lessons, but it works. So I think it's just a question of um, putting up the learning materials for that. If it's something you want to test drive, Michelle, I would be happy to um, talk talk with you about how to get it working. Um, Claire says, I'm interested to apply to borrow a set of Finch robots. Uh, you should email me about that um, because we, we're... We're out of the application cycle for summer, but I'm if there's a there's sort of still some rolling people coming in. So I think we can probably squeeze you in for summer. Um, all right, Diane, link to the Finch loan program. Yep. All right. I want to say thank you. This was wonderful. I learned so much about AI and I never thought of using it with the Finch and I just got Finches. So I personally am super excited, but thank you uh, so much for taking an hour out and, and sharing this with everyone. Um, we really appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for inviting us. It was really fun to do. I mean, I've, I've been enjoying doing these for the last six months or so. And I, I do think it's really it's topical, but it's also, it's important for, to provide resources where kids can actually dive into it instead of just saying, oh yeah, just use chat GPT. That counts as AI education, you know, <laughs> which they should, they should use chat GPT, I think, to explore it, but it's not the only thing, you know. Well, using it is learn how to use it when they've built their own machine learning model and they might not be going all the way under the hood, but when you've, explored a resource from the inside, it feels very different to use the finished product. Yeah. Very true. I also just want to share out to everyone who is there that if you like this, um, 
every uh, the second Thursday. It is the second Thursday of every month. We try to do something. This year it's been with an AI theme. Um, but we have, our next one is if you're in Massachusetts, it has to do with um, the high school graduation. They were looking to have a focus group on CS graduation requirement. But the one in April is on visualizing data with space images, which I'm super excited about too. It's, um, they're gonna look at how the satellites, like how they get the pictures, the, not how they use the images that they're getting from the satellite and how you can create visualized data with it. Or I said that wrong, data visualization. So it should be really fascinating. Tiffany's put the information in the chat. Um, definitely keep joining. And you both are more than welcome to join if you'd like to hear that one. That's it's gonna be cool. interesting. I love space. Yes, thank you again. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks all.